Okay, everybody, come on in. We want to get started right on time. We've got a tight 55 minutes. Good, the door's closed. Excellent. All right, so uh, we want to welcome Nick and the, the making of the bullet train. I'm Terrence Mouse. I'm just the host. I'm going to get off the stage. Just a quick note. Pay attention to the red. Please, no recording devices whatsoever. Uh, we are going to talk for, Nick's going to talk for about 50 minutes, roughly. We're going to save at least five minutes for Q&A at the end, so think about your questions now. Save them for the end, and uh, enjoy the show. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Nick Whiting. I'm the director of VR and AR at uh, Epic Games. And uh, also worth noting, uh, Nick Donaldson helped me prepare this presentation, but he couldn't make it today. So I'm taking over the whole thing. So if I break into a fake Australian accent, it's just me trying to be the other Nick, channeling him for the presentation. So welcome to the making of Bullet Train. Um, out of curiosity, how many of you guys have played Bullet Train? That's a pretty good number <laughs> by now. You know, it's only been out since uh, Oculus Connect 2, so not a lot of people have actually had a chance to, uh, to play with it. But if you haven't, it's upstairs in the marketplace on the second floor. Um, I, the lines are a little long, but uh, you guys should be able to squeak in and check it out. So I'm going to kind of go over today the uh, something of a post-mortem of Bullet Train, you know, kind of what our design constraints are, what our goals were, what we were trying to do with it. And then um, I feel it's really important, especially in the VR, AR space, to really kind of share our triumphs and our failures. So you're going to see a lot of things that we tried and we failed, and then we tried and kind of refined into what Bullet Train is today. And we don't have all the answers. We don't claim to have all the answers. But what we really want to do is you know, s spread the love, uh, tell you guys what worked for us, what didn't work for us, and let you guys kind of take that and adapt that into your own content. So first off, I think it's useful to kind of, you know, take a look at where we, how we got to this place, right? You know, we didn't start making the bullet train demo uh, until we've already had about five VR demos under our belt. We started VR about uh, three years ago. It was an after hours project for me. I got one of these like duct tape prototypes from the Oculus guys and I said, hey, we've got this cool hardware, but we don't have anything to show on it. So you guys want to do something? And we said, hey, yeah, sure. So after hours, I started kind of hooking it up and I took one of the original tech demos for Unreal Engine 4 called the Elemental Demo that was kind of in a, a castle setting. And uh, just simply slapped you in there, let you look around and kind of walk around. And you know, looking back, it looked cool, but it's you know, really pretty boring. It was really our first baby steps into VR. You know? It was cool because the novelty of being in that location in VR was cool, but it didn't really add anything to it. So when the Oculus came out with their Crystal Cove prototype, which was the first one that actually lets you, you know, track positionally as opposed to just rotationally, uh, we made another game, which was our first shot at uh, what one might call a game in VR, and it was called Strategy VR. And we took that same environment and put you across from this big Lava Knight character and had you playing a little mini game of tower defense. And there wasn't really much challenge to the game. These little dwarfs would just kind of walk through the thing, and you could mash buttons, and they would explode. But the cool thing was we were trying to play with a sense of scale. Um, so the, the, we wanted something really small in front of you so people were naturally kind of encouraged to look in without us trying to force the interaction on them. And actually, we joked, if we could get somebody to smack their head on the table because they were looking too far in, that would be success. And somebody did it on a press video. Um, so it got broadcast to everybody, and then we knew great success. Uh, following that up, when uh, Oculus first announced their DK2 at GDC 2014, we made a, a little game called Couch Nights. And the goal of this one was we really wanted to see what it was like having a multiplayer experience in uh, VR. You know, it's very powerful, the, the subtleties of body language and movement in VR. We're, we as humans are kind of very perceptive to those things. You know, you can tell uh, with very little information that something on the other side is a human versus something that's trying to act like a human. And so with Couch Nights, basically we simulated you and a buddy sitting in a room and we used the motion tracking from the head mounted display to solve for a, a player in the room that basically modeled your movement sitting down so you could lean forward, move your head around and your avatar in the game would do that while you're playing a little game that was kind of like Zelda uh, with these two little knight uh, toys fighting. It was basically like these toys came to life in your apartment uh, and you were fighting it out. And uh, slight plug, you can download it for free and see how we built it because we like to share how we actually uh, accomplish things. So you can download it from the marketplace with UE4. After that, we made a demo called Showdown, which was the first one that really started to get uh, wide coverage. And what this was, was basically NVIDIA was coming out with their 980 graphics card. And Oculus was coming out with their Crescent Bay, which was kind of their prototype for what the final version of the Oculus was going to come out. So 
we really wanted to see how far we could push both the hardware and uh, the uh, head-mounted display from Oculus. And so we made this demo that was basically you moving slow motion through a scene uh, where there's all this destruction happening around you. It's about seven seconds of content, but you're flying through it over a two-minute period, so you feel like you're kind of Neo from the Matrix. And all this stuff is happening around you, and you can look left and look right, and it keeps changing. And it's really cool. And you can download this one for free, too. Uh, next, we did uh, Thief in the Shadows, which where we worked with uh, Weta Digital to try to bring the, the dragon from Thief in the Shadows, uh, from the Hobbit movies, rather, uh, into VR. So we were really trying to push, can we hook up a film pipeline and take these film assets and bring the same sort of fidelity, but with the constraints of having to run at 90 frames a second at a higher resolution. Uh, and we did it. We learned a lot about the, uh, the movie uh, pipeline, which we weren't terribly familiar for, but it really helped us branch as Unreal Engine out from just a traditional games background into something that was more kind of adapted to the film industry. But all these previous efforts that we did have something in common, and that's the fact that we actually adapted content rather than built content from the ground up for VR. So when Oculus came to us and said, hey, we've got these Oculus touch controllers, motion controllers, um, you want to do something with it, we figured, hey, we've got something entirely new on this side, we should build something entirely new uh, to really kind of exploit the advantages that we get from motion controllers, and that was how Bullet Train got born. Uh, it was released first at Oculus Connect 2015, which was last September, if I remember correctly. And it was really kind of our first foray into, you know, what's only possible in VR? What does a game look like in VR? That's not just a simple kind of prototype. So with that in mind, for those of you that haven't tried it, we've got a short little video that's uh, a trailer of Bullet Train, so you can kind of get an idea of what the action is like. Initializing simulation. We are now pulling into the rail station. Be alert. The enemy will be waiting for you. Thanks to Tommy for capturing all that footage that uh, we put out there. That was all his two floating hands and badassery. So um, that's what the demo ended up looking like. But uh, when we started the project, basically the constraint that we had was that we had to make something in 10 weeks with a minimal amount of people. Um, and of course, you know, it's never easy in kind of an open carte blanche. So we had some design considerations for Bullet Train that were kind of imposed on us as project goals. You know, we really wanted to make sure that if we're going to spend time making a demo, that it actually fits some purpose and lets us try something new out in the engine. So the first of those goals was that we really needed to raise the visual bar of Showdown. Now, if you remember, Showdown was built on a 980 graphics card. Um, but what we really wanted to do for this one was target the Oculus recommended spec, which is a 970 card. And in our tests, that's anywhere between 15 to 30 percent slower, depending on your content. So we had to make it look better with less power, which easy, right? Um, the next thing is. Uh, Epic has traditionally been known for as a games company, but recently we've really kind of been branching out to uh, do architectural visualization and more serious applications. So we wanted to make the environment something that we could repurpose and say, hey, look, you know, not only can we make games in these environments, but the environments could be something that would be worthy of architectural visualization or you know, any sort of other kind of serious application. Next, we obviously had motion controllers, which is something we never had before. Um, and we really wanted to exploit the motion controllers and do something that we could never do before in VR without having actual hand presence in VR. And finally, as with all the demos, it's really about what we call dog fooding the engine. So we have use it ourselves to see where the pain points are. And when the guy next to you is yelling at you to improve something, it's much <laughs> you know greater impetus to actually get it fixed. You know, when the pain is your own, there's much more drive to uh, kind of recognize those problems. So for this scenario. Um, constraints, basically we were told that it couldn't be a, a sequel to Showdown. Showdown had, was cool, but it had kind of run its ground, and we wanted something that was completely new, kind of building upon a fresh slate. 
uh, we also said that the ga uh, gameplay had to be something that was only possible in VR. We wanted to really focus on the actions that you could only do with a, a motion controller. We didn't want you to be able to use a, you know, an Xbox gamepad or a PlayStation gamepad. We wanted something people to reach out, grab stuff, and really interact with the world. And finally, as I said, we know we didn't want to adapt content this time. We wanted to build content from the ground up to really kind of go through the paces our own and see what it's like to build content within the kind of performance constraints of VR. So what should we do? So focusing on the location first, uh, as I said, we wanted it to be somewhere that's architecturally and visually interesting so that we can show that the, render can, uh, the Unreal Engine renderer can do that sort of stuff. But the real challenge is that we only had six weeks to flesh that out. And we had a new employee that was plucked from the film industry who was extremely talented. Uh, but you know, never having made real-time content before and jumping right into the frying pan, it's like not only do you have to make real-time content, you have to make VR content, which is high res and high frame rate. So we kind of took him straight from the frying pan and just dropped him right into the fire and said, hey, you got six weeks to make something amazing. Good luck. Um, <laughs> the other constraint was that the environment itself really had to uh, fit the gameplay. So we w wanted to have multiple locations, advantages, and entry points so that we can make it you know, interesting for you, not just you know, somebody coming at you from a long haul, but we wanted you to be able to move around the space and you know, feel like you're actually inhabiting this game world. And for reasons that I'll discuss a little bit later, it had to include some sort of danger zone where the player didn't want to go. And I'll discuss the technical reason for that design constraint in a little bit. So looking around, Epic's headquarters is located in no Raleigh, North Carolina. So uh, the airport there is actually surprisingly cool architecturally. It's got these nice big wooden arches and these kind of big open, brightly lit areas. There's another kind of picture of it. And then also the uh, unfortunate <laughs> level uh, designer and art lead on this was uh, European. Your first idea is not to jump in the middle of train tracks. It's something you kind of naturally want to stay away from. So it kind of fit that constraint as well. So combining those two things, you get something like this, where you can see we kind of took the, the wood and the slow arches of the uh, Raleigh International Airport and added the, the train tracks, obviously, but also the high arch ceilings, which gave us a lot of room to kind of play with the space. We have a, a flying boss in the end in addition to the bosses that are, or the enemies that are on the ground. So it's a really kind of versatile play space. This was about two weeks into the project. So if you look at this compared to where we ended up, there's actually significant differences in the layout and the, the quality of the art as he kind of went through and refined it. But this was about two weeks worth of work for a guy that had never jumped into a real-time engine before. So while the majority of the assets were kind of custom built for Bullet Train, we did end up, because of the time constraints, buying a couple assets. But what we did was we took those assets and we kind of spiffed them up for our own use. So things like the train exterior, uh, we bought a weapon pack from the marketplace and we reskinned the, the, the main baddie as a uh, reskinned version of a guy from Infiltrator. But the kind of secret of that was we took those things as a starting point, plopped them in, and then kind of remodeled and retextured as appropriate to really make them fit our needs. So it looks good, uh, but kind of what do we do now uh, in terms of gameplay? So our first prototype was what we like to call Hogan's Alley after the old uh, Nintendo game where you had the zapper and there's kind of bad guys that appear in the windows and you kind of take little pot shots at them. So basically you'd stand at, uh, in front of this table that was filled with an everlasting supply of guns and robot enemies would come at you from the outside and you just kind of pick them off like you were defending the area. And you know, it was actually pretty fun just because the fact that using the guns in virtual reality and with the motion controllers is a really fun kind of visceral interaction. So uh, from this prototype, we really spent a lot of time focusing on what makes the guns feel good. We added what we call gun porn on there, just the little touches, the haptics on the gun that make it feel like you're actually holding a, a real gun uh, in your hand. Uh, and it also had kind of an added benefit that originally we were thinking about doing multiplayer with Bullet Train. And so we had two alleys, basically one facing this way and one facing this way. And you guys, you were with your friend kind of back to back shooting enemies and you could do things like, you know, high five your, your buddy and uh, you know, help him out if you're getting in trouble and stuff like that. And that was really cool and it was really engaging gameplay. But the problem was after a few minutes of that, you really kind of started to get a little bored because you're standing in the same place. You're always getting new guns. There's really no challenges. It kind of turns into shooting fish in a barrel. So we said, okay, that's cool. We learned some stuff, but what else can we look at? One of the next inspirations we had were uh, kind of the classic Asian action films. So um, one of the things we really liked in movies like Hard Boiled and, or Hard -boiled and Old Boy, there's these uh, things that they call one shots where they're moving through the scene and all this action takes place with an unbro uh, unbroken camera cut. So the camera's following, tracking this guy and a lot of action is kind of happening in the same scene. And we thought that was great because you can't really cut the camera in VR and it lets you move through a space. So here's kind of an example of this from the movie Old Boy where the, the hero is the guy beating up everybody in the middle and he's kind of you know punching one guy, taking the hammer from him, beating the next guy, all while the camera's moving through the scene. 
And that really solved the lack of movement problem that was in Hogan's Alley because we could move the player like we did in Showdown constantly through the scene. And he would beat up the first guy, maybe take the you know, gun from him and then shoot the next guy and then take his baton and then beat the next guy. And it was interesting and it was also nice because it was constrained. So we always knew the path that the player was taking through there. We only had to make AI to fit those scenarios. And it fit our kind of constraint of we didn't have to actually make a lot of content to fill the action. You can get even more fancy like uh, in this one from Old Boy and change the camera direction on it. But we found you have to be really, really careful if you're going to try to change the camera direction because that sideways and lateral movement really tends to trigger simulation sickness in people that are sensitive. It's not that you can't do it. It's just that you've got to be very careful and very deliberate about it. So one of the other things about this was kind of what I mentioned where you attack one enemy and use him to attack the next person. We came up with this kind of, or borrowed, I should say, this concept of chaining. And what that means is you take something that you have, use it to attack the enemy, go up to him, take something he has, and then attack the next enemy. So an anatomy of a simple chain using this awesome programmer art that I did myself, so I know it's amazing. If you see the player is the one with the gun there, he's got two enemies he needs to engage. So he's got a couple different options. He can obviously just you know bang, bang, and shoot him. But if he wants to get fancy, the player can actually toss his weapon at the first guy, knock him out. He can teleport to that guy, grab his gun back, and then shoot the next enemy and they're both dead, and then he gets a shit-eating grin on his face because he did, did something that's really awesome. So we really like that uh, fact and that bit of gameplay in there, and that actually became something that was central to bullet train. So our option two, the Asian action film, the advantages were that it solves the movement through the environment and kept things interesting while keeping them constrained because we didn't have to do a lot of animations, we didn't have to do a lot of AI, um, and it didn't have a lot of uh, animation needs. And finally, that chaining gameplay was something that was just so compelling that everybody that did it really had this awesome shit-eating grin on their face, and we really wanted to keep that through the end. So what happened in practice, because there's, there's always a but, um, it works great when you're stationary and you're interacting with objects in front of you, and that's because of the, the physicality of the device. So if you look at that diagram up there, the slightly rotund uh, player is the, the black thing in the middle. The red is his head-mounted display on his head, and then the two spheres in the hand are his uh, motion controllers. The two uh, blue things up at the top are the tracking cameras for the Oculus. That's how it does its drift correction to track the player's motion. So the gray bits are the frustum for those cameras. So anytime those red dots are in the gray frustum, you can be tracked. But it also needs to have line of sight to those. So that's the blue lines coming on. So anytime those trackers can see all the three red points, you're fine, you're golden. But what happens is when the player is moving and taking over targets, they tend to rotate slightly. And when you rotate, you can see that even though he's still in the gray tracking volume, his right hand is kind of occluded by his left hand and the camera can't see it. So that in, in game, that means your hand freezes or it flies off. You lose presence and it really brings you out of the experience. So the problem with the original idea was that as you're moving through the scene, you're beating up somebody over here on the right, you kind of start turning and then you're beating up somebody over on the left and then on the right. But if you just don't actually kill this guy in the time, you're floating past him and you want to keep attacking him, you start turning around physically. And that blocks you from tracking and then you lose your hands and then the whole experience just kind of goes to hell. So that was actually no good. So the movement kept things fun, but uh, and like with Showdown, we can move characters to the environment in a controlled way. But we really needed to control the angle and the engagement distance in order to uh, make sure that the people physically in the real world stay in a place where the trackers can actually track them. So we learned something, but what snap? Option three was just, hey, let's resort to magic because that's the easiest solution to everything. So we wanted to take the best parts of the stationary shooter in that we controlled the distance and you were always facing the trackers and always facing the right direction. Then take the bits of the Asian action film where we were moving through the environment and that we had uh, the kind of bombastic chaining action and then throw the rules out the window. What else could we do? And he said, since you're a disembodied set of hands anyway, why don't we just let you teleport around the level? And we're like, that's pretty awesome. It gives us control about where the player goes so we don't need to model the entire level in super high fidelity, just the places that the player can actually teleport to. It controls the direction that they're facing because we control the angle of where the teleporting is. And it's less overwhelming to players because they're not moving through a scene. They don't have that sense of panic that, oh, I'm going to beat this guy up or miss him. They can teleport when they want to. They can kind of go at their own pace. So when you look at the teleporter system in Bullet Train and the level, this is kind of looking down on the level. Those red arrows are where all the teleport locations are and the direction that they're facing. So you notice that they're all pointing towards the center of the, the level. And that's because we wanted it so no matter where you're facing, if we kept the action in the center, you would always physically in the real world be facing the tracking camera. So if you teleported across the level, you're facing the other way, you get a new vantage. But in the real world, you're not tempted to turn around and move. Um, so 
we placed those things strategically around the center and then tried to keep the action in the center. And if, if you remember, I said that we needed a danger no-go spot. Um, that was the train tracks in the middle because we didn't want the player to feel tempted or obligated to go into the center uh, and s kind of subconsciously make it so they always want to kind of stick to these teleport uh, locations on the outside. And it worked. Uh, for the most part, people kind of stayed focused in the, the center of the, the world and they could have their gameplay interactions. The chaining was still there. But there's a few tricks that we needed to do to make the teleport actually feel good. The first was we added what we call the teleport blink, which is basically just a fade up to white in about a quarter second. And that helps because if you cut instantly, people feel very disoriented because you're not used to teleporting in the real world. But if you blink, especially at about the rate that your eye is actually blinks, um, people accept it. It's kind of a quick fade to white and fade down. And people are like, oh, I faded away, and now I'm back somewhere else. And they just kind of buy it subconsciously. The thing that really helped drive it home, though, was adding a kind of a whoop sound to it. I did all the sound effects in the game, too. Um, but it, that sound kind of reinforces, if you reinforce visually and audio, people buy that something happened, something changed, I'm in another location, I'll just go with it. Um, the other problem, though, was when you're teleporting across the level, you're orienting to a new direction. And we wanted to kind of help you get your bearings in the new direction. So we added a little trail that when you zip from A to B, it kind of follows you latent. So when you're at the new teleport location, you can kind of see this trail coming towards you from where you came. And that really helped kind of reinforce, I was over here, now I'm over here, so I know where I am relative to where I was. And then people feel more grounded. Uh, the next thing we had to tweak a little bit was the teleporter selection. So you press a button, you hold it down, and you can see these teleporters in the world. But how you select them actually, first we thought we could just let the players look at them and then release the button and teleport to them. And that works fine when they're not in the action. But when bullets are flying and action has happened, people are kind of looking around and they're not always looking where they wanted to go. So we couldn't rely on their gaze to actually show their intent of where they wanted to go. So we moved the teleporter instead from the head which is something people aren't usually used to controlling to a very fine degree, to the hands. And so you could just kind of point where you wanted to go. And even if I was looking over here at the enemies, I can still point over here at the teleporter beam, and then I'm at the new location. And it was much more natural for players. So how do we get that awesome action movie feel? The teleporters uh, aren't close to the enemy, so how do I reach in and you know grab the gun out of the guy's hand or throw the gun and then teleport and grab the gun from the guy's hand? And to do that, we added something called Stealth Teleport, which it means in addition to the static locations of the teleporters that were around uh, the level, you could also teleport right up to the guys. And we would put you at kind of the perfect engagement distance at about a meter and a half away so that you can reach out, grab the gun from the guy, and shoot him more. If you threw something at him, you can grab the gun back out of the air. Um, so we called that the ability to reach out and punch someone. And that's really what kept the chaining combos in there, even though you weren't moving through the scene physically. So teleporters were nice, but they're, to be honest, they're not without their own issues. As I mentioned, the reorientation still tends to confuse some players, especially players that haven't done VR experiences before and aren't used to some of the kind of abstractions that we use in there. So it's not perfect. We try to make it as easy as possible, but inevitably somebody kind of gets very disoriented. Uh, the other problem is that, especially when the action starts to get really frantic, people want to move around the local space. You know, they open up and they see there's cover over here, so they start diving over here, or bullets are coming and they start ducking and diving. And actually, they still run into things. In fact, if you go up to the marketplace, you'll see a big black scratch on the ceiling where somebody was reaching up and punched the ceiling. Fortunately, the controller survived, but uh, it's still a, a factor to take into consideration. No matter how much you want people to, to keep their feet planted, they'll still try to get out. Um, the other problem is that this is a game, right? And the action doesn't always keep in the center. So the AI always try to stay in front of you. So if you, you know, intentionally turn around and look the wrong way, the AI will start going around you. Um, and it, it doesn't let us solve that problem of keeping facing in the tracking. So there's tweaks you can do there, but uh, it's not a perfect solution. And a lot of people, after they teleport off the train, just simply forget that they can teleport anymore. So they play the entire game from the first teleport location. Even though they've been trained to teleport through the train at the beginning, they get out and they never teleport again. And I would say almost half the people that play are, fall into that category. So as a small uh, side bonus lesson that was really kind of counterintuitive to us, um, but I wanted to point it out here, is that in Bullet Train, when you teleport, uh, you hold down a button. And with that same button, we also slow down time. So it's like the matrix. It's like bullet time. And that's all uh, on one button. Originally, it was on two. But we found that it was too hard for people to keep two buttons tracked in their mind. So compared to a traditional game, though, uh, Bullet Train is pretty simple. Basically, the ob actions you can do are grab, shoot, and then slow-mo and teleport. So there's only three actions. So if you compare that to something 
you know, modern console game where you can do, you know, 10, 20 different actions on the controller. There's not a lot going on there. So we figured we could have slow-mo and teleport on two different buttons, but that's kind of a lot for people that are new to an experience. They've never used motion controls before. Maybe they've never used VR before. That's a lot to keep in your head, and especially while you're being shot at. So it begs the question, are control cords worth it, basically holding down multiple buttons at the same time? We think maybe, but not quite yet. We found that people will probably learn to control things in VR. You can get really good at the game, but until we can you know, just do simple things like reliably pick up objects and interact with it, we really need to keep things as simple as possible and temper our expectations of what the player is actually capable of. So now we know how we're going to get around. What about the ga gameplay that we put in the world? So we have guns, grenades, rockets stubbed in. But they're cool on their own, but how do we really take them to the next level and make them awesome? And the thing we kept coming back for is we need to make you feel like a badass. We, everybody wants to be Neo, so we should use that as our kind of metric for how successful a feature is. So we decided early on that failure is just not an option. Um, very few people um, kind of around the world have used VR, uh, and even few of the, fewer of them, especially when we launched this, had used motion controls. So it's likely that this was their first experience on one or the other, and we really wanted to kind of let them have fun without them having to feel like they're constantly in danger of failing. So early on, we decided that you could never die. You can only become more badass. And we also added uh, lots of invisible helpers along the way to make people's actions that they're maybe not so good at in real life actually better in VR. One of the first examples of that is kind of the throwing mechanic. So it turns out, in real life, not many people are great at throwing things. Um, so <laughs> but when you throw something and actually hits your mark, it's an incredibly satisfying thing. So if I throw the, the pistol across the room and I hit that guy in the face, that feels really damn good. So in order to kind of do that, we help them out a little bit with an invisible helper. So we've got our awesome programmer art player again. And he's got three guys in front of him. And he also happens to have a grenade in his hand. So he throws the grenade. And nine times out of 10, he whiffs it, which sucks, right? You want to be able to hit that guy in the head. The gr since it's a grenade, it'll still blow up and kill them, but it's not as cool as throwing it, hitting the guy in the chest, and then it blowing up in his chest. So <coughs> what we did was we added a cone to the vision to say, hey, what is the player looking at, and what's he likely intending to throw at? And then we had these little hints that we let our designers put on the players. They're little targets, basically, that are invisible to the player, but uh, visible to our, our systems in the back. It says. These are the, the six areas on here that we think that he might, it might be cool if he aimed at. And then we kind of draw a line out to each of those, figure out based on that which one it's likely to, that he's aiming for. And then we make a plausible uh, velocity arc towards that. So it looks like you could have thrown that and hit it um, without just being completely obvious. So I say not completely obvious, so I'm going to show you a video of it way over exaggerated and completely obvious so I can show you how it looks. So in this next video, the guy's going to grab the grenade, teleport up, and throw it into a group of guys. It's going to shoot out uh, a little bit exaggerated and hit the guy in the back. And so the anatomy of that, basically, is we take the view, we trace to the plausible targets, and we compute the path based on the, hand, the player's velocity. So it has to feel like it's coming out of their hand. We try a few different arcs uh, to get to the destination. And if we find one that's plausible, we throw it at them. But the key is that we don't make it obvious. If, we can, if the player just really whiffed it, and there's nothing that we can do that makes it look like they actually got it there, we just don't do it. Because then they don't feel like they earned it, and they felt like the game was uh, helping them out too much. And that really doesn't drive home, I'm a badass. This is, oh, somebody's helping me out. I feel less like a badass. Because in the end, nobody likes to be coddled. You remember the poor goat from Jurassic Park? They tied him up. The T-Rex was supposed to go feed on him, but the T-Rex didn't like that. There was no challenge in it. The goat was tied up, so he just decided to break out and wreak havoc and eat all the humans. It's no fun when you don't feel like you've earned it. So another one along those lines was the rocket throwing. So as you saw in the beginning trailer, one of the original ideas was for the boss to throw rock or shoot rockets at you. You're supposed to grab them, aim them back, let them go, and it goes and shoots the, uh, blows up the guy. And some people got this, but other people kind of failed spectacularly. So the intended workflow was our little programmer art hero here was supposed to see the boss. The boss was supposed to shoot a rocket at you. You're supposed to grab the rocket, point it back at the boss, and just let it go, and it zips right towards him. Here's another quick video of that happening. You can grab the rockets and aim them at the enemy. Now we're 
great when uh, game designers played the game, which you know was totally good enough, right? But when other people actually played, it more often than not ended up looking like this. You go whoop, and the rocket would blow up in your face, and that's not fun. That's decidedly not badass. So we said, hey, let's look at some players that are doing this, try to figure out what's going wrong. And more often than not, when players failed, it was because they were trying to throw the rocket like a football or a ball. Um, you know, we wanted them to grab it, point it, and just let it go, but they were like, I'm gonna throw it back at the guy. And because of that, when they let it go, it was aimed towards the ground and it would just shoot down straight. So the solution was, in addition to letting them release the rocket, let's let them throw rockets. So the new mechanic was player grabs the rocket, and when they throw it, we average the last few frames of their velocity to try to figure out where they're roughly aiming, and then we let it go in that intent. And then we had little visual flourishes so it like starts waving off like it's more uncontrolled, like you just threw you know, a rocket that has its engine going uh, behind it. And that got most of the people there most of the time. You know, People were no longer throwing the, the rocket right down there, but some people, no names, but Brendan Arib, the CEO of Oculus, still had some trouble hitting the target, and we really had to fix that before we demoed at Oculus Connect. So <laughs> what do we do? So what we decided to do is every time you throw a rocket and completely whiff it, we'll give you a little bit of an aim assist. So that's your first, you really suck. Your second one, you start aiming the rocket going up towards the boss. And then the last one, you still are whiffing it. You still suck, but we aim the rocket up towards you. <laughs> and the key to this, not feeling like they, they didn't earn it, is that you have to do the assist delay. So we don't actually kick the homing in until the rocket is away from you. So it looks like you still threw it, and then it kind of arcs up and hits him later. And people are much less perceptive to the fact that we turned on aim assist later. And the other key was we started from no aim assist, so they really suck the first few times, but then they feel like, oh, I'm starting to get it. I'm getting better at this. This is awesome. And so our motto with that was kind of the longer you suck, the less you suck. <laughs> and a lot of people don't notice. They're just really happy to blow up the boss. They're like, I'm finally getting it. This is great. <laughs> and really what that is all about is playing to the player's expectations. They want to believe that they're getting better. They want to believe that they're doing good. And the best metric of what makes people feel badass is to uh, let them play and then see where they're disappointed. And the pro tip with this is that you, they don't often actually tell you where they are getting excited and whatnot. If you ask somebody after they've been playing for 10 minutes and there's all sorts of stuff blowing up, they'll maybe give you one or two things that maybe not the most important things. But if you watch the player, you see their facial reaction, you hear when they say, ah, you see when they smile, you see when they have the shitty and grin, that's the best time. Um, you watch them and you observe them rather than asking them directly. And so our playtest loop, which is pretty familiar to those in the gaming industry, is we implement a feature, we playtest the shit out of it, we listen for the awe of disappointment, and then we go back to 10 and implement the feature and playtest it all over again. And this led to quite a few of the, the cooler features in Bullet Train. What we really wanted to do is create a sandbox where people could do anything they could think of within the rules of our system and feel awesome. So things like bullet catching out of the air and throwing them back at enemies came from this. The Terminator style shotgun pumping. You don't have to pump it with two hands. You can just do the Arnold and uh, doing gun uh, juggling or like taking a grenade, throwing it up and shooting it with a pistol are all possible because of these playtest things. So really what we wanted to do was create something like Oculus's toy box demo where you had a lot of things to play with, but with guns and explosions because discovery is really the most fun thing you can do in the experience. And that's all about setting up and meeting expectations. So this is the part where I start to sound like an Australian because McDonald's can help me with this portion. So uh, basically, meeting uh, expectations, the, the fundamental rule we obeyed was that if you dangle a carrot in front of somebody, if you give them something awesome that they want to play with, they're going to try to play with it. They're going to bite. So if you set up the player's expectations that they could do something, you really got to be prepared to satisfy them. And it can be something that's really stupid simple. Like when you start out in bullet train, there's little hand rings that are physically simulated. Once we turn them physically simulated, they're kind of waving up there. And the first thing people want to do since they're in the face is reach up and kind of grab them. Um, so the first thing that we did once we saw that was like, oh, everybody that goes in the train starts to grab things. Let's let them kind of boop the rings back and forth uh, with their hands. So um, when we met the player's expectation, they reached up and it actually reacted to them. They just got so happy over such a stupid little thing. But apparently people really love to boop things, and that's just a natural human <laughs> reaction. <laughs> so kind of on the converse side of that, um, we, added, uh, we have a grenade in the game, and it's got this little grenade ring there, and that was physically simulated. So it's flopping around. It's something that's up in your face. When you're playing with a grenade, you see the, the pin go. And what's everybody think when they have a grenade and a pin is like, in order to throw this, I got to pull the pin out and throw it. So uh, we didn't actually have time to implement that, but we left the pin in. So people would pick it up and like keep trying to pull the pin out of the grenade, but there's no way to do it. And they would just take the headset off, like, is something broken? Am I doing something wrong? But in reality, all they had to do was throw the damn grenade and it would blow up. Um, so it really kind of took people out of the experience and it was just kind of an instant fail. So 
We didn't get that in time for Oculus Connect, but we went back and implemented it for GDC. But the problem is, on the Oculus Touch controllers, there's two different uh, modalities. When you grab something, there's a middle finger trigger, so if you squeeze your hand like that, you can pull things and pick things up, and that's how we interacted with everything in the world. There's also a trigger, which we only used up to this point for firing the guns, so Nick Donaldson implemented the, uh, the pin pull on the grenade and gave it to Tommy, our producer, and said, hey, check it out. And the first thing he does is try to stick his middle finger, or his ring finger in there, uh, or index finger, in there and pull the pin grenade with the trigger. He didn't even think to do the grenade, or use the grip system. And that's kind of an instant failure. Your expectation is you want to pull it with your, your uh, pointer finger, but our, all of our systems are built around the grab. So it's an instant fail, an instant disappointment, because you feel stupid. So we had to rewrite the logic at the lowest level to actually support the trigger pull to pull that in addition to holding with the grip. And it felt great and it was totally worth it, even though it cost about two days of time to really rejigger all the systems that we needed to. So the next is uh, guns and players' expectations. So because our game is kind of focused around this gun, about gunplay, we really wanted to make sure that they met players' expectations because actually not a lot of our players had actually shot guns and so not a lot of people knew what they actually felt like. So when people grab the gun in the beginning of the game, there was two pistols and you're supposed to shoot some targets. They grabbed them and they pointed down too much, it seemed. Uh, they would p take the pistol and if they're aiming up here, they would actually hit the floor in front of it. So the pistol on that was the, the worst offender because I think people have a, an image in their mind of how you hold a pistol even if they've never held a pistol because they've seen movies and played games and stuff. Um, because actual gun people actually lined up the sights, pulled the trigger, and had good alignment, and they hit the, the target on the first time. But people that hadn't held a gun had an expectation of what a gun should be like. So we needed a way to kind of quickly and easily align the guns to the controller. And there's kind of two possible ways to do that. The first one is the method that they used in uh, the Oculus Toy Box demo, which was the first uh, Oculus Touch demo out there made by Oculus themselves. And their main goal was they really wanted to match the player's real hand with the virtual hand in there. They wanted that to be as accurate as possible for, to develop what they called hand presence, feeling like your actual hands are in the, the VR world. So the way that they did it was they took the controller's position from the SDK and attached that hand directly to it so that they can make sure that the, the player's physical hand always attached to the controller in the most accurate way possible. And then they would attach whatever it was to the, the virtual hand in there. So there's two, uh, a layer of indirection between where the controller is and where the gun is. It's a simpler approach. And in general, it's more consistent with your hand. It really does meet the need of I'm going to make you know basically hand presence, and I want to match the virtual representation with the real representation as much as possible. But it was really hard for us to align guns that way. And it's kind of uh, the interactivity of it is just not as good. So our method. Instead of attaching the gun to the hand, we took the controller, attached the gun to that, and then the hand attaches to the gun. So the hand isn't necessarily perfectly aligned, but in our game, what you're really interacting with is the gun. You want the gun to feel as accurate as possible, and you don't care if your hand is a few degrees off of angle or a few uh, millimeters out of position. It makes it much, much easier to kind of adjust that angle so that we can try to fit the Oculus controller to where the gun naturally feels like it should go in your hand. So. With that method, getting the exact alignment is easy, um, and it takes some tweaking of the atoms of the hand to get it to line up. But again, we weren't as concerned with that. What we really wanted to do was make sure that the hand felt great, uh, or the gun itself felt great instead of the hand. So even with that, the Oculus controller is a little bit smaller than uh, what an actual gun is, so we had to kind of make some judgment calls. So what was the best alignment? Honestly, it's something that we're still kind of debating. You know, you have options of lining the palm up to the back of the controller. You can align the trigger up where the trigger is in the game. Do you basically just put it in the middle at the, the average? What we ended up was something about like this. This was our best fit. It's kind of halfway between aligning the back of the controller with the, the back of the gun and the trigger button on the controller with the palm. And now most people are able to pick up the gun and have a, a good expectation of where they're going to shoot it. And most of the time, people don't complain about it, which is about as best as we can figure with you know, the diversity of people and their level of experience with guns. So for future work, what we're thinking is you know, maybe we ask people to shoot the target, because that'll be exactly what their expectation is. I hold the gun right here. I'm pointing it at that target. I'm going to shoot, and I'm going to hit it. So maybe we adjust that angle a little bit based on how people hold the controller personally. I'm not sure if it'll work, but maybe it will. Uh, the next thing was seeing bullets. And this was a reaction to. Uh, when they were up close and shooting things in the train, they couldn't really tell if they missed where they hit because when you shoot a real gun, you know, the bullets are flying super fast. You can't see the bullet itself, um, and the, sometimes the little uh, bullet impacts are kind of hard to uh, see. 
But the nice thing is we're making a game and not really a simulation, so uh, bullet speed is kind of flexible, and Yoda says it's not a simulation. So we can believe Yoda and go ahead and change the bullets. What we actually ended up doing was starting, when you fire a bullet, it starts out at a quarter of what the actual bullet speed was so that you can see it leaving the barrel and kind of get an idea of where the trajectory is going. And then over about a tenth of a second, you accelerate it to uh, one and a quarter of its pre uh, old speed. And then uh, that actually makes it so the bullet's impacted about the same time, but you can see the bullet leaving the gun. And then you have the information that you need to correct it. You can see, oh, I'm shooting too low, I'm shooting left, I'm shooting right. And s people stopped complaining about missing shots. Uh, it wasn't that they were missing shots left, but they had the information to actually correct their shots so they could see that they were getting better at the game. They had the feedback that they needed in order to actually connect with the targets. And it's funny because literally nobody noticed that Nick Donaldson did this. He asked me right before we did a, a presentation at GDC, hey, did you know the bullets come out of the gun super slow and speed up? I'm like, I had no idea. And I played the game hundreds and hundreds of times, and I never noticed that he actually made the change. So it worked out pretty effectively by just kind of cheating reality a little bit. Next thing is the guns. Since they were kind of the focus, we really wanted to make sure that we captured kind of their essence uh, of what it's like to play with them in a little bit of an exaggerated way. The first thing is we wanted them to feel like they're physical objects. You know, guns, if you hold them, they're very heavy. They're made of metal and wood, and they have a very big physical presence. They're a little bit unwieldy. Um, if you move around a, a, you know, a small compact space, you can get in the way and bang things on them. The next thing is that they're very visceral. When you shoot a gun, it's actually kind of terrifying, right? There's an explosion. It's a loud sound. You can smell the smoke from the gunpowder, the oil from the gun. It's a very kind of visceral experience, and we wanted to translate as much of that as we could as possible into the game. And finally, we just wanted it to be fun. I mean, that's when it comes down to it, um, we would make sacrifices to realism in order to make it more fun. So when we started prototyping, these are from our Hogan's Alley uh, demo, but they're just basically designer art where we took a bunch of boxes, kind of kit-bashed them together into the guns. But the thing was, this allowed us to prototype the guns uh, and, and their functionality and make them fun without actually having to have the, the full model in there. And there was really nothing that these guns uh, di didn't do that the final guns did. So all of our gameplay and our physicality and our trying to add visceral things to them were prototyped on these just simple boxes. We didn't need the full model to do it. So in order to kind of induce some physicality to the guns, we initially made them actual physically simulated objects within the game. We had a basically a physics binding on the hand that said, hey, here's this physics object that you have. Attach it to this point and give it a little bit of play with kind of a, a spring constraint. It was super easy to set up because all you're doing is saying, hey, take this object and attach it to this object. And then it's still physically simulating. So if I bash stuff with it, it'll kind of deflect like it was an actual physical object. And the movement felt really natural because it's a big heavy weight, so it was naturally kind of damped. And to do recoil, to kind of make it feel more visceral, we added an impulse to the end of the gun, so it would kind of randomly shoot your gun barrel up every time you fired. And since it was a real physical object that was being physically simulated, it was just felt natural. It's what recoil is doing in real life, so we basically got that for free by just adding an impulse in it. And when you shot more than one time, since it was a physics impulse, it would just keep, kind of keep climbing like a real gun would. And one of the side notes is, we've noticed when we were playing other shooters that a lot of people just kind of completely exclude uh, recoil in there, and we can't really figure out why. Our, our best guess is that people are really, you know, kind of anal about the hand presence, and we want the hand to line up exactly, and they don't want any deviation, but it really helps sell the kind of volatility that you have a big thing that's exploding in your hand, and so we think it's really worth the trade of trading hand presence for the recoil, but if anybody has any ideas, we would love to figure out why nobody's <laughs> using recoil. So kind of getting back to the guns, because they were physical objects, the guns would collide with everything. So you could take, if you had two pistols in your hand, you can click them together, you could click them on the desk. Here there's a, a small little haptic effect and a sound effect, so when you bash the gun on the table, it makes sound, and it felt really, really good. But, and there's always but, um, the guns would get snagged on things. So if you, I had a, a rifle in my hand and I put it over this desk, and started pulling, the rifle would get stuck back here while my hand was here, and it would just start wobbling and then eventually pop back to your hand. And that's just really weird <laughs> in immersion breaking, especially in VR. Um, so the bigger the gun, the bigger the problem. So when you're moving around, uh, if you had a rifle in your hand, it would get caught on all sorts of things, and it would just it ma make the gameplay feel really, really wonky. And that ended up being a deal breaker for us. So what we did was instead of physically simulating the guns, we manually phys uh, simulated the things that we liked. So we really liked that physics smoothed the position because it was a big weighty object. Um, we also liked that the physics caused an impulse on the recoil and that it was easy just to grab a gun and then drop it and it was a physical object in the world. For smoothing the gun position, low latency, everybody always says, you know, 
uh, with VR, low latency is, you know, above all, you have to have the latency as low as possible. In the Unreal Engine, we go through a lot of engineering pains in order to make the latency as low as possible. And even on the motion controllers, we spend a lot of time doing the update as late as we can so that we can send the most up-to-date position information to the graphics when you render it so that it feels like it's matching you as closely as possible. But the problem with that is if it's too accurate um, and you don't have any latency, when you're holding a gun, it feels like it's a very kind of weightless object. It's very shaky because you're basically your hand is shaky, but your hand isn't actually holding a physical object. So after a few copies, you know, this is maybe what it looks like if you have the absolute lowest latency we can achieve in the Unreal Engine and you're holding a gun out there. It, it feels like it's a little plastic toy, right? So what we actually did was we smoothed it by taking a few frames of hysteresis and damping the position as you moved it. And that makes the gun go from looking like this. There we go. To looking like this. It has much more sense of weight. It's much more damp. You pay a few frames of latency, but it feels so much better. And you don't mind because in the real world, if you're whipping a gun around like that, it's going to take a few seconds to catch up anyway. So that simple little change that goes kind of counter to what you know the, the VR Bible says that we need to do in lowering latency. Going against it in this case was really the ideal. So the next thing we wanted to recreate was the physics impulse from the recoil. So usually in the original one, we just added a little physical impulse and it popped back. And we really got that to feel really good, so we wanted to recreate that feeling exactly. So what we did was actually use the timeline to simulate recoil. And this is Blueprints, our visual scripting system. You'll notice how nicely laid out this is. Nick Donaldson says that each Blueprint should look like a New York City subway map very pristinely laid out and not spaghetti. Uh, but basically what we do is we take that timeline up there in the left and record where the position of the gun is and then add a little rotation to it uh, over a, a linear curve and then uh, uh, the recoil pops up. So this is what it looks like if we don't actually correct the recoil. You see that the gun just kind of keeps popping up like that. We have a little action on the slide to kind of sell the motion. But the recoil is cumulative. So if you shot much faster, you would kind of climb much faster. So we wanted to simulate what you would do in real life, you know, trying to control the recoil by pushing the gun down. So on the tick, every time we try to bleed back to whatever that original position was when you started firing with just this simple little set of nodes. And what that does like is go a little bit like that. So you, you fire, it pops up, but it kind of slowly fades back down. And when you fire like rapidly, like in slow-mo, you can really see it. It, it starts climbing just like a real gun would in real life. So all functionality of that was built into the, the master gun class. So we had a base class where the pistol, the rifle, the shotgun all derived from. And basically, we tuned the, the recoil so that we could just change the amount of recoil per weapon. So heavier weapons got a, a little more recoil. If the gun was more powerful, you got more recoil. And it was super simple just to change that multiplier. And we got all the guns in using the same system. The downside of all this was that we still really missed kind of bumping into things with the gun in the world. We'd love to keep that physicality. We have some ideas maybe if the gun brushes up and catches as soon as it deviates more than you know a couple centimeters, maybe pop it to the hand or bleed back. It's something that we really want to get down, but we feel that the, the gestalt of all the other stuff kind of makes up for the lack of physicality in the guns. Next up is uh, grabbing. So actually grabbing things in the real world and uh, the virtual reality world is <laughs> kind of a, a challenge. Initially, we just added a little sphere around the motion controller, and we decided um, that you would just reach out, and if that sphere was overlapping anything when you pulled the grip trigger, you would pick it up. It would attach to the hand. Um, that kind of mimicked real-world interaction distances because the sphere was about the size of your hand, so if I wanted to grab this piece of paper, I would just put my hand overlapping, squeeze the grip button, and grab it. And s people had a surprisingly hard amount of time. For as intuitive as that seems, uh, a lot of people just couldn't grab objects. Most of the time, people would start, they wouldn't actually go up to the, the object that they were trying to grab. They would just kind of sit back here and start flapping the, the grip thing, like, come to me, come to me, come to me. Uh, and then people would try to grab things that were just too far away. They would reach towards that piece of paper, not follow through, and just start grabbing, it, and it wouldn't come to them. So we figured maybe people had some you know, really bad depth perception or something. But <laughs> in actuality, I think the system deviated from what their expectation was. So a few observations. When you reach out to grab something, uh, people really mentally combine a whole lot of steps. You know, reaching out, squeezing your hand, looking at the shadows to judge my distance to it, the physicality of actually touching the object, that's all built into one interaction. That's something that we've been doing since we're very, very young, um, and it's something that we're just kind of hardwired to do. When we start to break that down in VR, um, you don't have that physicality. You don't necessarily have the lighting and the shadowing. Um, your, your reflex is just to kind of squeeze your fingers because you expect it to be there. People kind of standoffish with virtual objects. If we did what we, um, people were doing in real life, 
it would look something like this. You kind of just look retarded. <laughs> and that's what an actual grab should look like. But you notice if we go back to this other one, it's, it's almost downright creepy. Oh, I can't get it to play. Oh, well, forget. Yeah, it's just creepy watching somebody do that. Uh, so a few things we tried. Uh, we added some sensory feedback. when uh, We borrowed this from the Oculus Toy Box demo, but uh, when you started reaching for something and then we, you were in the position to grab it, we added a small buzz in the haptic so that you could actually feel something. In it. And that actually worked pretty well. If we really want to dive deeper into it and say, you know, not only is it distance-based, maybe it buzzes more when I get closer to it. Does the angle um, that I'm pointing at it affect the haptics? I think there's a lot of potential there to really sit down and do a, a study over a couple days uh, of th ways we can improve that. The second thing we kind of borrowed from games is that we highlighted the object when you can interact with it. So when people see something change in a game, that's kind of their immediate cue that they, uh, they can interact with it, do something with it. And the same seemed to hold true in the VR experience. As soon as people saw that things could change to yellow, they'd want to kind of reach out and grab it. And we made it in a uh, material highlight function because we wanted, unlike the pistol, we wanted you to be able to grab it with one hand and then maybe grab the slide on the other. So being able to control which area of the gun highlighted was very important to us. But you know, we, with that spear, it still wasn't enough to actually make the people grab things successfully. So what we did was we figured we could extend the volume. Since people didn't seem to go all the way forward, let's just make that a cylinder that we trace out as opposed to just a sphere. So you kind of, you know, if I'm reaching out for that paper and the, the cylinder overlaps, I can just grab it and it kind of force pulls up into it. And this actually helped us solve another issue, was that bending over to pick up stuff sucks, as this little guy is, is finding out. When you, when you reach down, you know, it, it's very hard. You lose tracking <laughs> or the ball just falls right back out of the tube. <laughs> And Oculus Toy Box got around this by just destroying things that hit the ground, and we didn't really want to do that. Um, so the force pull really seemed like our solution, but we were kind of curious, how far away should you make it a yourself able to, to force pull? How, how long is it believable? And we found out it's about two meters is the answer we came up with. But the problem is, if you push it that far, your intent and determining what the, the player's intent is, uh, is actually becomes really hard because there could be multiple things in the, the field. You need to really figure out if there's three guns lined up, how do I know which one he's trying to grab if I, my cylinder is overlapping all of them. So what we originally tried was this. Basically, this is the cylinder. The, the red vector is the basically the forward direction of the hand. And this way, you're trying to point at exactly what you want. But you notice if you try to reach down and grab something, which is a very natural motion, you're not actually pointing at the gun, so you can't grab it. So if I try to reach this piece of paper, I have to physically point at the object, which isn't a very natural uh, motion. I'll let you watch it one more time. See, you guys go down and reach the glove. But since you're not pointing at it, our system couldn't detect it. So our solution is to say, hey, they're probably looking at what they're trying to grab. So what if we use a eye to hand vector? So that vector that your hand's pointing at, uh, take the vector from your head to that your hand, and that's probably a more likely target for what you're going for. And this is what that looks like. You know, you can see it, it solves the problem of trying to reach down onto something. But you'll notice when people kind of come in from the side to grab something, which I'll do in a second, like that, if I come in from the side, I can't actually grab anything because we're going from the eye to the hand, and the hand is too far over to the right. So that was much better, uh, but we still, uh, you couldn't always grab the things. You, your intent wasn't always communicated. So we tried a halfway vector, halfway between where your hand's pointing and where your, the vector from your head to your hand goes. And that actually was a lot more expressive. This is that. Um, the, the red is arrow is just for reference, but you can see um, you can reach down on top of them. You can kind of reach up from the side and grab them. And it's much, much more expressive for people that try to grab things in the multitude of ways that we try to grab things in real life. So that was a solution. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. One thing that we're really keen on is seeing if eye tracking helps us add another metric to this so that we can not only take their head look at uh, implementation, but what they're actually looking at with their eyes and see if we can uh, better kind of suss out what they're going for. So force grab kind of worked for us. It solved most of the issues we we're picking up. Um, and we kind of sidestepped some issues without uh, about getting close to the, the enemies. You could still grab the guns out of their hands. You can grab them from the side and stuff, um, and it allowed for some really fun situations. You can, you know, grab things out of the air. It was very easy. All of a sudden, people could do gun juggling, and it was just great fun, basically. And to kind of wrap up, we'll talk about prototyping for the fun. And this is what we call my first bullet train experience. And th what we're really talking about here, if you've been in game development, you know that there's a point about 90% of the way through the game where all the little bits and parts of it just suddenly come together, and it actually feels like an experience, and it's actually fun. So 
we kind of talked about what led us to these decisions and, you know, how we started solving all the different pieces of the puzzle. But once it started uh, fitting together, it really became something more. All the pieces kind of formed into the, the gameplay narrative, and we came up with what we call the oh shit moment. And it goes a little something like this. You say, oh shit, what if I could take that, or kill that guy and take his gun and just grab it out of the air? Oh shit, what if I could throw my gun at him and then teleport to him and take it back? Oh shit, what if I could grab both of the guns from him after throwing them at them and take them back? And like, oh shit, what if I could do all that, cross my hands, blow them both away, and drop the guns and, you know, drop the mic? And th basically the first time we played that, we're like, oh shit, that's Bullet Train. That's where the fun is. And so here's a, uh, a video capture from one of the first moments that Bullet Train actually felt like Bullet Train, where we did exactly that. Toss the gun at the guy, hit him, he gets knocked out, teleport to him, grab both the guns, cross the arms, then drop the mic, and we're done. <laughs> and that's when Bullet Train felt like Bullet Train. Thank you. I'd like to say special thanks to Ryan, Chad, Jerome, Tommy, Artem, and the rest of the team. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, man. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and we have about one minute for maybe one question. So who's the lucky? <laughs> <laughs> who's the lucky person? We've got a hand up in the middle over there. Thanks for the chance. Um, as I learned, uh, the Oculus Rift uh, has this sort of directional bias in, in its VR setup for sort of room scale. Yeah. Uh, do you think this is a, a big problem, uh, especially when thinking of a VR market, so you will develop for the Vive and the Rift and yeah, motion controllers? I, I think it's it's really the biggest d you know determining factor when you're making a game for Steam VR or you're making a game for Oculus. I think you see it kind of in the launch content of the two. You know, the the Vive content is really focused around exploring a small area and turning around and really feeling the world, where the Oculus content focuses on making everything in front of you really spectacular and really awesome. And I think it's a, it kind of a natural progression, but the the technology is still very young, right? And I, I know that for a fact they have to be working on that problem, right? It's a limitation of the current technology, but so much of the rest of the technology really kind of makes up for it in some ways. I'm sure in the end game, you know, 360 tracking is going to be a requirement. Uh, and, and they're going to develop something even cooler. So I, it's a limitation right now, and it forces us to come with creative solutions. But in a lot of ways, I like those technological limitations uh, put on us because that makes us more creative with what we try to do with them. But yeah, it is a very big de uh, determining factor between the two. Cool. And uh, yeah, so embrace your limitations. That's a good, <laughs> good closing note. Uh, <laughs> another last round of applause, and we'll turn the room over for next. Thanks, Nick. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. Thanks. Excellent.